afternoon, respected uh, members of SGI, senior colleagues and dear friends. At the outset, let, let me thank Dr. Manoj Kumar Sahu and Dr. Avinash for giving me this opportunity. I'm also honored to be part of this uh, panel discussion uh, with uh, Dr. Santeep, who is a pioneer in uh, management of uh, pancreatic fluid collection. So I would talk about US drainage of pancreatic fluid collection, what and when. There are different type of pancreatic fluid collections which occur after an acute pancreatitis. This can be within the first four weeks or after the four weeks of the index incident. This can be an acute peripancreatic fluid collection which occurs after an interstitial pancreatitis or an acute necrotic collection after a necrotizing pancreatitis. After a four week period, there, some of these fluid collection develop uh, an encapsulation leading to pancreatic pseudocyst or world of necrosis. But some of this fluid collection may also disappear. Of this, a pancreatic pseudocyst and world of necrosis are the one which are usually managed endoscopically. While pancreatic pseudocyst, there is no solid con content. The world of necrosis has liquid as well as non-liquid content and may, might contain Localations. So, when should one intervene endoscopically? Not all patients would require endoscopic therapy, but if one is symptomatic or if someone has complications like infection, bleeding, rupture, or fistulization to adjacent structure, then you would require intervention. <clears throat> if someone is having severe abdominal pain or pressure effect on surrounding structures causing symptoms, they would require intervention. While talking about intervention, we should also know when not to do EUS drainage. If the cyst character is not well defined or if the cyst is away from the lumen and not accessible, one should not go for EUS drainage. If there is a doubt regarding the cyst, whether it is a cystic neoplasm, then you should confirm that before doing any procedure. If there is a complication like pseudoaneurysm, this should be tackled by interventional radiology before embarking on EUS drainage. The prerequisite for EUS drainage is an, a good imaging modality. It should be a combination of CT and MRI. MRI is preferred, especially a T2-weighted MRI, to see for the necrotic material. So MRI delineates the necrotic material much better. It also would give an idea of the nature of MPD. The viruses or pseudoaneurysm can be seen well seen in a contrast enhanced CT. When you think of intervening in pancreatic fluid collection, then there are certain factors which should be taken into account. One is whether there is any amount of necrosis within the collection. If the necrotic, if the necrosis is very less, less than 10%, you require only, only few sessions or may not require any further sessions after the initial therapy. The more than necrotic element, then you would require more sessions, especially for necrosectomy. This has been shown elegant, elegantly by Dr. Rana. So pancreatic pseudocysts are one which does not have any necrotic material. It can happen with chronic pancreatitis as well as acute interstitial pancreatitis or with disconnected duct syndrome. This uh, pseudocyst is one which develops after four weeks of acute pancreatitis and has got a well-defined wall. It has been shown that the endotherapy has got equal success rate as surgery and less complications. So if a cyst is amenable to therapy, then endotherapy is preferred. It has got higher technical success rate conventional, con compared to conventional drainage when it is done by endoscopic ultrasound guidance. And it also reduces the complications 
and avoiding any vessels on the wall of uh, through which uh, the puncture is done. While doing cystogastrostomy, you should place a stent. A double pigtail, seven or 10 French is recommended. There is no difference as per the number or size of the stent. And it is said that more than one would always be better. EUS guided drainage shortens the length of hospital stay and it is less costly than surgery. And it has been found that it gives better quality of life at 18 months of follow-up. You can also do uh, <clears throat> lamps. It is easy to do, but it is very costly. And if, you are, if one is placing <clears throat> a lamp, it should be removed within the next four weeks because there is increased risk of complications. Plastic stents, though more cumbersome to do, it is cheaper and it has got the advantage of being left alone indefinitely if there is a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome and the outcome is at par with the lamps. Vault of necrosis is a collection with the, which it can be intrapancreatic or extrapancreatic location with well-defined wall. It has liquid and non-liquid contents and anything which happens more than four weeks after necrotizing pancreatitis. So there is a, an encapsulated wall and wall may happen even before four weeks. But when you think of managing wall of necrosis, you should have a multidisciplinary team which includes an endoscopist, intensivist, interventional radiologist, and surgeon. The type of management of world of necrosis has been depicted by various trials. And one of this is the tension trial looked at endoscopic step-up approach versus surgical step-up approach, which included a percutaneous necros uh, necros um, drainage uh, followed by video-assisted retropancreatic um, uh, drainage. This was a multi-center randomized superiority trial with involving 19 hospitals in Netherlands. It was found that endoscopic step-up approach was not superior to surgical step-up approach. That is, it is equal in reducing major complications of death. And, the, I, and also the rate of pancreatic fistulas and length of hospital stay was lower in the endoscopic group. Another trial, that is a MICER trial, looked at minimal invasive surgery versus endoscopy. It was found that the endoscopic transluminal approach reduced major complications, lowered cost, and increased quality of life. So endoscopic therapy is better in, with less complications than surgery. Can it be done before four weeks? Yes, the encapsulation might happen in a small percentage, but it is associated with increased risk of mortality and increased risk of surgery. The other factor which uh, dictates the type of drainage is whether the patient has got multiple collection. If so, a multi-gate approach would be required. If the collection is away from the endoscopic axis, dual or percutaneous drainage or ward or surgical minimus drainage might be required. If there's a disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome, which is usually seen more frequently in world of necrosis, as per the study from Sandeep's group, about 73.8%, about 74% of world of necrosis uh, is the cause for disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. And of this, uh, those patients who recurs have recurrence of pancreatic fluid collection, 97% of them have disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. So it is said that a long-term plastic stent after drainage would help in these patients. Endoscopic drainage include us guided transgastric puncture and placement of stent, which may be a plastic or fully covered stems or lamps, or in, along with the nasocystic drain uh, for uh, irrigation, followed by a direct necro endoscopic necrosectomy. Whether a metal or plastic stent is, uh, is best for pancreatic fluid collection drainage, this has been looked at by a study from Shyam Vardrajalu's uh, group. It has found that there was no difference. 
It has been found uh, later on that EU-specific metal stents reduces the duration of procedure easier and it makes the direct endoscopic necrosectomy easier and with better clinical efficacy and lower morbidity. But this comes at a higher cost of procedure. The necrosectomy can be done at the time of the index intervention, especially if so, if facing a uh, lamps and if it is more than 40% necrotic material or poor drainage of cyst contents. The second intervention can be done. Um, it can be done as a second intervention if there is non-resolution of world of necrosis or persistent symptoms. The complications of necrosectomy include bleeding, perforation, pancreatic fistula, or infection. The overall complication rate has been documented as 36%. The complications happen when the stent is placed for more than um, four weeks, and if it is more than 14 days, then the risk increase increases. So the Adua 7 events were looked at in a trial from the Shams group again. It has found that pancreatic fluid collection, if it is less than seven centimeters, and if the removal is after four weeks, then there is increased risk of adverse events. To, to prevent the complications, the lamp should be removed within four weeks and placement of a double pictage stent through the lamps would help prevent the complications. Should a transpapillary stent or ERCP be required? If transmural drainage is performed, an addition of transpapillary drainage seems to add no benefit and ERCP is required, uh, is not routinely required. If one wants to see whether there is a disruption of the pancreatic duct, a secretin pancreas, uh, enhanced MRCP would be better. Insertion of a stent across a partial MPD a rupture is the indication for ERCP, but it, it succeeds only in, in 33 to 67% of the patients. How to follow up these patients? The specific timing is lacking. These patients can be monitored for any increase in any new symptoms, organ failure, or signs of sepsis, or signs of local complications. And to follow up this patient, CT is the imaging of choice. When should one remove the stent? Lamps should be removed by four weeks. If it is a stent in pseudocyst, it consider removal by six weeks after regression of pseudocyst. A secretin enhanced MRCP is Advice prior to removal, if no ductal disruption, remove, uh, this stent can be removed, is disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome, a long-term plastic stent placement would help. When would surgery or percutaneous drainage is required? If the uh, collection is inaccessible endoscopically, or if there is complications during procedure, or if there is failure of endotherapy. So how to summarize, to give an algorithmic uh, approach in patients with pancreatic fluid collection it can be either pseudocyst or world of necrosis. In pseudocyst, a plastic stent would suffice in world of necrosis, depending on the collection or a pancreatic disconnection or frank extension, a dual mo modality may be required. And for world of necrosis, LAMPS is is preferred than a plastic stent. To summarize, pancreatic fluid collection, consider intervention in symptomatic or com patients with complications. Endoscopic step-up approach is associated with less complications. EU-specific stents are preferred, especially in world of necrosis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Manoj Sahu and his entire team for organizing this uh, midterm SGI endocon. In this session, I would be speaking as a topic on the slide you can see is EUS guided drainage of pancreatic fluid collection. 
how to do it. In this technical talk, I will be speaking on the steps of drainage of pancreatic fluid collection and when to decide how to use a plastic or a metal stand. As we all know that pancreatic fluid collections are broadly classified into two when they are mature as either pseudocyst which do not have any debris and walled of necrosis or worn as they are commonly called have debris inside the fluid cavity of variable percentage. As you can see on this uh, screen, the two small videos which are playing are showing huge collections. The one on the left panel is a pure pseudocyst does not show any debris and so is the one on the right panel which shows a large collection which is on almost U-shaped and also we can see a little bit of pancreas with upstream dilated pancreatic duct. So, both these collections are pure pseudocyst. We can also see by US some of the collections which are bilobar or they have a minimal communication between the two and sometimes we can also see collections which are extending into the mediastinum as you can see in this MRI. What we want to know during EOS assessment is whether the collection has debris or not as you can see in both the images and are there any interposing vessels. So, these are some of the important things before we take a decision of EOS guided drainage and why we do EOS guided drainage is that EOS helps in improved localization, it helps in visualizing and avoiding interposing vessels in the wall of PFC when we are draining them, select the best point of entry which is generally the thinnest point that we choose especially if the scope is in a straight position without any loops and the point of entry should be as dependent as possible. So, these few things we take into consideration before we decide where to drain from and it also has enables us to drain collections which are non-bulging in the uh, stomach or duodenum or esophagus. The only drawback compared to a duodenoscopic guided collection drainage is that the channel diameter is 0.5 millimeter lesser. Here it is 3.7 in EUS, whereas a therapeutic duodenoscope has 4.2 channels. So, a 10 French tent, if you want to place, has its challenge to be passed across. So, let us go to the steps of uh, EUS guided uh, drainage of the pancreatic fluid collection. And uh, I have divided this into five steps, and the first step is further subdivided into smaller steps. So, before we do anything, we inspect the collection. So, that is a very, very important point to know for the maturity of the collection, to know what is the content inside. For example, on the left side, you see purely liquid, but a little bit of debris also inside. You want to measure the longest dimensions, uh, both in anteroposterior and uh, laterally. Measure the wall thickness. Also, find out what is your scope position because then your ease of accessories will be different. If it is in a long position, it will be more difficult to pass your accessories in and out. Look for the vessels, so Doppler has to be checked and then finally select the point of entry where you would like to go. If you are going from the stomach, it is always preferred to use uh, the posterior wall so that it is directly into the lesser sac or the superior part which is the upper part of the lesser sac. But if you are hitting anteriorly on the stomach, then there is a risk of perforation. So, having done the inspection as we see do it now, you see the variable amount of debris. So, on each frame the debris quantum looks different. So, you have to make an overall assessment and this is how what we mean by measurements. So, the two lines should be perpendicular to each other that gives a pure uh, measurement in two dimensions. Having done that, then we make a puncture into the collection and and the standard way we do is, we is a 19 gauge FNA needle. Also, we can sometimes use cystotome, which Europeans generally prefer, uh, 10 French, 6 French combination uh, cystotome. But whichever way you enter the, the, the world of necrosis or pseudocyst, after puncture, we need to take out the fluid for analysis. So, and that you can also inspect whether it is pus, pure fluid, turbid fluid and so on and so forth. It is sent for analysis. Some people do inject contrast, but personally we do not at our center uh, for the simple reason that this can add to the risk of infection and does not give any extra advantage. The third step is and these are the several needles that you can see on the screen. Each needle is equally good and uh, there is no extra advantage with one needle over the other. Whichever you are comfortable with with FNA, you can use that needle for initial puncture if you are using uh, FNA needle for puncture. 
So, there are alternate methods of access to the pancreatic fluid collections and these can be either direct puncture using a flexible soft cystotome which I mentioned earlier a 6 French cystotome with a combination of 10 in the same assembly can be used or some centers prefer needle knife, but this is a very dangerous uh, equipment to be used for access. I will explain it later and whichever way we enter we aspirate the fluid after removing the stylet and this is sent for analysis our cultures and so on and so forth. So, if you see the devices for access is needle or cystotome or needle knife. So, these are the current requiring devices and these are mechanical needle type devices. The advantage is that it is visible, you can easily transmit your force from the handle to the tip, but the downside is that it is rigid and sometimes it gives a tangential puncture. There can be shear of the wire. The advantage of cystotome or needle knife is it is flexible, you can adjust the angle and cautery allows easy, easier penetration although needle also does the same, but the downside is they are not so well visible and they may change direction when you enter plus they can be cautery trauma. So, these are the downsides. So, it depends on your experience or your center's experience, but personally I prefer a needle uh, for entering the collection. Then we go to the next step is uh, after aspirating the fluid, we pass a guide wire inside the collection which can actually be seen on EOS as well. You can see it coming and coiling inside nicely and if you want to be doubly sure that the wire is nicely coiled, you can use a fluoroscopy to make to see that at least two or more coils are made in a small collection, but a large collection one single coil is good enough. And the wire that we generally prefer is 035 or a 025 inch uh, long guide wires. My personal preference is to use a little angle tip wire rather than a straight wire for the simple reason that if I use a straight wire it hits the opposite wall and the wall is not mature it can perforate and go beyond. Whereas an angle tip wire even if it hits the opposite wall it does not give so much of a pressure or a puncture it can bounce off even an immature wall. So, that is an advantage. This is what I meant by a straight wire and an angle tip wire. So, once you have the guide wire well inside, then you withdraw your needle leaving the guide wire inside and this movement with your has to be in a coordinated fashion with your technician so that you accidentally do not pull out the wire because then we have to start all over again. The next step now is creating a cystoenteric fistula depending on which site you have entered from stomach, esophagus or duodenum and there are two ways to do it. Either you do mechanical uh, dilation that is you use uh, over this wire a tapered catheter or a bougie or a stiff balloon, all can be used or we can use an electrosurgical devices like a cystotome, 6 French cystotome which goes over the guide wire as you can see it here like this one and some people use needle knife, but again this is fraught with danger as you can see the needle knife can go in a different direction compared to where the guide wire is. So, you can go tangentially and cause dissection of the wall and cause even bleeding of the vessel which are not visible. Staying with the mechanical dilation, we can either use bougie and balloon. As the name suggests, bougies are uh, tapered catheters which can be in the same catheter, you can have several diameters or you can use several types of it. Balloon is another way of 4 or 6 millimeter uh, short balloons which are stiff and they can go down easily inside the cavity. So, the downside of balloons is perforation and bleeding can happen and downside of a bougie is that axial force may sometimes dissect the tissue planes. But my favorite is a 6 French cystotome which is passed over the guide wire, it is coaxial, follows the guide wire and sometimes it can be challenging in long position, but nevertheless it goes in fairly well. Needle knife I would always resist from using unless nothing else is available. And these are the examples of how it looks like, here the guide wire is inside and a and a cannula, tapered cannula is being pushed in. A tapered cannula does not have st enough stiffness, but if the wall is very thin, it can go in or you can use a stiffer bougies. The right panel shows the guide wire with a cystotome going in, almost always works. And the third step is to dilate now this fistula with a balloon, which can vary in caliber depending on where you have entered from. In stomach, we use 10 to 15 millimeter balloon for esophagus. 4 to 6 millimeter balloon should be okay for a duodenum 6 to 8 millimeter balloon. You can also see the balloon on fluoro on EUS and if you fill with contrast you can also see an on fluoroscopy, but that is often not required. 
EUS is generally good enough and tells you that you are inside and if you have any doubt you can just pull back your scope and distend the stomach a little bit you can see the balloon fully inflated across the wall. The last step here is placement of the stent. Uh, for a plastic stent we use double pigtail, never use a straight stent and always place more than one stent, two or more stents are preferred and if you decide to place two stents it is better to place two guide wires before and then start placing stent one by one. And how do we place two guide wires? You can either use a double lumen cannula or a 10 French pusher tube which can accommodate two or three wires or sometimes a loop wire is passed over the first wire which is placed. And once you have both the wires nicely inside, coiled inside the collection, then you place the 7 French is our preferred uh, size, caliber and the length that we use is 4 or 5 centimeters long. Here I would like to tell you that most of these stents do not have a radio opaque marker. It is best to put a radio opaque marker in the center of the stent which will tell you that it is now going in inside. So the aim is to keep half the stent inside the collection as you can see on the screen and half the stent in the gastric lumen. Try not to push 3 fourth inside and 1 fourth in the stomach. This is a very important slide which I would like your attention on. Which imaging is used in which step? So at the inspection level, we only use EUS, very logical. For puncture, it is only EUS image. We do not use fluoroscopy or endoscopy. For passing the guide wire, we use EUS definitely. We can use fluoroscopy if you are not able to see the, the wire on the EUS image or you are not very sure. The next step of uh, passing a cystotome, again EUS tells us almost the entire steps, but if you have a doubt, you can cross check on fluoroscopy. The next step of balloon dilatation of this fistula, we can do everything on EUS as I showed in one of the videos, but you can also use fluoroscopy when the contrast is injected inside the balloon and you can cross check with endoscopy. If you are not sure whether the balloon is little bit outside the lumen, in outside the wall of the entry point into the stomach. And last but not the least is the step of stent placement. In either case, metal or plastic stent, whichever we use, we definitely use EUS image to see the inner flange or the inner part of the stent going in and endoscopy to see the gastric end of the balloon or fluoroscopy to see the inner flange and then the, uh, the gastric side is seen by the endoscopic view. So combination of EUS for the inner end of plastic or metal and for the gastric side endoscopic view or fluoroscopic view if you are leaving the stent inside the channel and then pushing it out. Then comes the step of walled off necrosectomy, walled off uh, necrosis which may sometimes require necrosectomy and this is generally done for patients who are not improving with the standard management. That means you have placed the stent, fluid has drained out but the patient remains symptomatic or it still continues to have fever or develops a new onset fever. This means that the, 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 the debris inside has now got infected either because of procedure or because now you have made it communicating with the, with the bowel. In that case, we need to take out this dead tissue which is a, a good culture ground for the bacteria to grow and in endoscopic necrosectomy, we take the endoscope inside the cavity. It is a very labor intensive procedure, can take half an hour to 45 minutes or sometimes even an hour. They are high risk procedures, can have complications. And that is where the role of large caliber metal stents have come into picture. These LCMS or large caliber metal stents are broadly classified as LAMPs, which you all know, lumen opposing metal stent, Axios and SPACs are the two important stents in this category. And bi flange metal stents, which are, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> are stents which have flanges, but they are a little longer than the <coughs> exact wall of the collection and they do not oppose the two lumens uh, in which they are placed. Just keep the lumen patent and allow the debris to drain out from the content of the, the cavity into the lumen. Nagi stent is the commonest uh, type of the bi flange stent that we use. Let me show you an example of uh, how an Agi stent is placed. The initial steps remain the same. You puncture, pass the guide wire, pass a cystotome, pass a small caliber balloon. So this is a cystotome going in and then we dilate this path with a balloon. The aim is that the assembly which is about 10.5 French can slide in easily. So this is a 4 millimeter balloon, 4 or 6 millimeter generally safe. 
This is not meant for draining the collection, but mainly meant for allowing the assembly to go in easily. And once the stent is inside, you can, here we are look, deploying partly under the endoscopic view and partly under the US view. So, this is a gastric side deployed and you can see the nice position of the inner end. And these stents expand with passage of time. Over next 2 to 3 days, they will reach their intended diameter that they are supposed to and we now we prefer a 16 millimeter, the largest caliber available, which can be seen both in endoscopy, fluoroscopy and on US like a bow shape. And these collections rapidly reduce in size. They drain very efficiently. All these stents are equally good. In case uh, the debris inside and does not drain out the solid component and the patient develops some symptoms, then we need to re-intervene. And endoscopy at this stage becomes very important. So, a person who is getting a new onset, some symptoms of pain or fever, or his symptoms have not subsided and you had an index procedure, some debris inside, then it is good to do an endoscopy after doing uh, some kind of imaging CT screening or ultrasound. And during endoscopy, often we find that the loose debris, which is large in chunk, bigger than the diameter of the stent, can come and clog it. And these can easily be teased out by several accessories. And the braided snare is our commonest accessory that we use, which holds this uh, uh, loose debris, catches it well and then takes it out. And that is the job done. So, the stent which was blocked now has become unblocked and all the fluid can then drain out. There can be many more debris inside which can then block. So, you can actually quickly peep after removing this clogged debris. See inside how the cyst cavity looks like, is the granulation tissue present. If there are more loose debris, you can do at that procedure itself, remove all of them. If the debris is stuck to the back wall of the cyst and not coming out easily and the patient re requires uh, some kind of an intervention, then this may be a good idea to place a nasocystic tube because an adherent large debris, it is a labor intensive procedure and may not do justice just by spending time and nibbling out those adherent debris. So, it is best to just irrigate with hydrogen peroxide or saline or a combination of two. We generally prefer saline, but if somebody has an infection inside, then we pass uh, adenine peroxide also 8 hourly 10 to 20 ml. The last step is to actually physically remove this debris. In this patient, as you can see, a lot of pus is coming out and he has symptoms. So, this was uh, removed by the snare going inside the cavity, catching bits and pieces and then taking it out. Hot axios is now the current standard in most of the parts of the world where uh, you place this very super efficient stent, lumen opposing stent. And this is we, where we prefer in patients who have significant amount of debris where necrosectomy is almost always required. And once you see the collection, we pass the, the device which has uh, four steps marked on the assembly itself. The first is puncturing on a with high cautery uh, intensity, pure cut or auto cut mode of 100 watts, avoiding the blood vessel in between which is what I am doing now. And once we are inside, then we go to the second step of releasing the inner flange. As you can see it here, the inner flange has got released. And then we go to the third step and we pull back the sheath of the assembly so that the stent inner end gets little deformed. And then we deploy the, the gastric end of the stent, which can be done endoscopic view or directly in the channel. If you see this black marker here, then you can do it endoscopically. And you see a frank pus draining out in this patient. So, these are the, the animation of, uh, this is the animation which shows how the stent is deployed. So, inner end flange deployed. And these are very easy to use uh, methods, the steps. Uh, after first few stents placement, then you understand that what is the logic of all the steps. Very nicely designed stent. So, the advantage of large caliber metal stents is that are easy to deploy very high technical success. They are large diameters, so they drain very efficiently. They are fully covered, so prevent any leaks and perforations. They are self-expandable, so prevent any entry site bleed. And as they expand, the fluid keeps draining and so does the solid debris if it is loose. The design is saddle shaped or biflange, which reduces the chance of migration. 
and re-intervention through the stent can always be done using a forward beam regular endoscope. There are few da disadvantages also of these stents, sometimes malpositions can occur. There is a very short gap of uh, what you call uh, margin of error. So, malpositions if it occurs then the whole stent you have to remove and use another one. So, that comes the cost. Bleedings can sometimes occur from the vessels on the opposite wall of the collection, which happens when the stent is deployed, the fluid drains out, which is initially working like a cushion and once the fluid drains out, the back wall comes and hits the inner end of the stent and that may have vessels inside and that can cause bleeding. Migrations can happen either spontaneously, more often with uh, biflange metal stents, but can also occur with the uh, lambs as well or at the time of direct endoscopic necrosectomy. Also at, at den, we can sometimes, these stents can be hindrance to the view and then we have to remove it and replace it later on. So, which stent to use, metal or plastic? The If it is pure fluid collection without any debris, that is pseudocyst, then plastic stent is better, equally efficient and safe. Those vault of necrosis which have minimal debris, and that estimate if you make at the index procedure of drainage, say 10 percent or 20 percent or less, you can safely put those plastic stents. But those which have high amount of debris, 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent and they have to be drained, I think a metal stent is a justified uh, at that point of time. So, there is a gray area between 10 and 30 percent, but less than 10 you can do with plastic, 10 to 20 to 30 you can choose whichever is available and the cost uh, constraints, but above 30 percent of debris in the overall scenario of the collection, a metal stent is better. This is one such example of a necrosectomy through a metal stent. There is an Nagi stand now, you can see the debris which is large clogging inside. So, you tease it out, push it in gently, get a good favorable anatomical orientation of the debris and catch it with a braided snare, which is a preferred instrument to remove the debris, both from the lumen at decoggling and also at the time of uh, removing from inside the cavity. And sometimes you may be lucky enough to get a very large collection hanging out almost entire neck debris has come out. So, in the end I would like to sum up by saying take home message that metal scent should be used for worn with significant debris, plastic scent should be used for pseudocysts or those with minimal debris, re-intervene only based on symptoms of the patient, example persistent SIRS or new onset symptoms and re-intervention procedures can be several, it can be cleaning the stent lumen, lavaging the, the cavity, doing direct endoscopic necrosectomy or sometimes multiple gateway technique or sinus tract and necrosectomy and last but not the least surgery in case the patient is not improving at all. One must remember to remove these uh, metal stents at a, after a finite interval. They should not be inside for more than 3 to 4 weeks. This you must ensure to the patient that it has to be removed whereas the plastic stents are much safer and can be taped for a long time. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Ravindra. Any questions to both of them, Dr. Prakash and Dr. Sandeep? Oh, my question to Dr. Sandeep is like, you know, given a choice, like, what is his take on multi gate technique? Dr. Sandeep. What's the SEMS? What's the SEMS? If Sandeep is not there, Prakash can take up. Yeah, Prakash can take up. Yeah. So, if multi gate <laughs> technique is uh, something which uh, can be used when there are multi, large multiple cysts or a, a very large cyst where uh, the drainage seems to be inadequate. So, in that situation, uh, multi gate technique uh, would allow better drainage of uh, the pseudo cyst. No, uh, in case of one, uh, would you, uh, I mean, uh, will it di directly because there are some advocates of uh, multi gate techniques even for one? Yeah. Do, you, do, do you prefer that or directly a metal stent would be better? See, in our situation, there is an issue of cost because uh, um, lamps is something which is very costly. So, we have to have, um, in our situation, uh, those patients who cannot afford lamps, 
multi gate technique is one thing which can be used but the other one which can be used is placing a nasocystic drainage along with the uh, stent which will help uh, the drainage of or uh, or the removal of the debris because multi gate technique is something which might not be very easy especially if uh, your window is not uh, that great especially uh, while doing us so the other option in uh, in our situation when a patient cannot afford a uh, lamps is to place a nasocystic drain and uh, lavage it along with the stent dr satya prakash sir any questions yeah. uh, prakash you were uh, mentioning that you know the us guided placement of lamps is little superior to rcp guided procedure because earlier before us we are all doing the uh, you know rcp guided procedure apart from the technical uh, you know you are also mentioning about the cost factor which is little higher with the us guided procedure taking away the cost factor what are the disadvantages or advantages because we have more people doing rcp guided procedures rather than us us guided any specific precautions you advise or you just totally uh, go against placement of uh, metal stents through rcp scope yeah your point is uh, uh, something uh, very, very much relevant uh, we all have been doing uh, rcp guided uh, just uh, you know, blind procedures but blind procedures should be uh, for uh, left for patients who have a real good bulge so if you don't have a good bulge then it is better not to uh, venture into a blind procedure that is just rcp guided but uh, using the side wing scope uh if and uh, yeah, if there are and uh, another thing is we prior to the procedure when you do um, an imaging if there are a lot of viruses then this should not be considered at all so if the uh, if the cyst uh, does not produce much uh, much bulge then us guided procedure is is the is the way to go and also if you feel that the if the uh, cyst is slightly away uh, and it is accessible then also us guided procedure is the one which should be involved and us the another important thing is that you can see all the you can avoid vessels on the wall while doing the procedure which will not be possible when you do just a blind procedure with the ercp scope so uh, that is something uh, which should be taken into account so with all these advantages if if there is a bulging really good mature cyst uh, without any viruses without any pseudo aneurysm even now you can go uh, for a uh, 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 using a normal side wing endoscope and do the puncture but Thank these you. are the that's nice dr uh, matthew sir anything to add not uh, much because they have covered everything and both the presentations were excellent and uh, i just want to uh, only tell the people who are really want to start the procedure definitely they should be uh, should be knowing the accessories very well now because you know doing with uh, hot axios if you are not very uh, familiar with the uh, mechanisms or technique or at least you should your technician should know very well and uh, at least non instance i know that uh, there was a technical issue and um, finally the it was a technical fault of the hot axios and uh, then we had to struggle for that so these are all very important but i think you know the hot axios is really an excellent uh, device at present except for the cost in patients with uh, uh, w uh, waldorf necrosis i think that is a very easy one step procedure dr sandeep you are there ड्रेनेजन 
Dr. Sandeep. Shut up, Paul. Yes, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes. Hello. Welcome back. Can Wherever you. you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm here only, but I, there were some technical glitches, so I could not log in. I could hear my lecture, but uh, some of the questions and comments I could miss out. So, can I thank you for that question. I think that's a very tough one, and there's no right answer for that. But there is some experience from PJ Chandigarh and Surender Rana has published on it, and uh, those patients who have sued. Uh, we are not able to hear you, sir. Hello, Dr. Sandeep, you are not audible. Dr. Prakash, can you take this question? How soon post pseudo aneurysm coiling you can do the pseudo cyst um, drainage? Prakash. Hello. Ah. Uh. Yes, we are, we are hearing you. Tell. Sorry. Hello. Yes. So, on this uh, question of aneurysms, and we have to take take care of aneurysms first. In at least yes. a week or two weeks, we'll be waiting before we drain the collections. Okay. After tackling the aneurysm by intervention radiology. Right. Right. Thank you. What is the role of irrigation of the cyst? Is it mandatory that you take care, or unless you find the solid uh, material on the MR, uh, you take care? Because you don't inspect immediately the cyst uh, uh, after placing a stent. Uh, is it a routine procedure to irrigate the cyst after placing a stent? Prakash or Sandeep? So if I can. Sandeep, you are not audible. Dr. Prakash? Yeah. So the thing is, uh, after uh, placing a stent, if there is large amount of debris, like if it is more than 40%, then uh, there is a, a, a group of, uh, I mean, there is a thought that it, uh, a direct endoscopic necrosectomy at the index procedure itself may be helpful in some. But uh, at the same time, there is uh, a thought that uh, it might lead to uh, uh, complications. But when you are placing a lance, this, this may not be there. But if you are not inspecting it, then and if, you, uh, if the previous imaging showed a lot of debris, uh, then a, 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 some kind of um, a flushing uh, can be done by placing a uh, nasocystic uh, drain. But uh, usually uh, this uh, um, uh, hydrogen peroxide and uh, all would be done after clearing the uh, most of the debris. Uh, you uh, instill the hydrogen peroxide into the system. But that would help in uh, removing the rest of the uh, debris. Pragash and Sandeep, can I, can I ask a question? Suppose Suppose a patient uh, he has got an infected pseudocyst because you know you puncture and see the pus is coming out. Any other precautions you want to do? Sandeep or Pragash, because it was not diagnosed early and you puncture and you find out that the, the what you get is uh, frank pus. What will be your next option? So, the question uh, is whether will you put Will you put a nasocystic drain? Yeah. Will you always put a, a, a expandable stent for that? So, uh, when you have a um, an infected pseudocyst, then it would be better to drain out the whole thing. So, in in such a situation, a large caliber metallic stent, if you can place, that would be very helpful. Or you can place a nasocystic drain along with the a stent. I think Dr. Matthew, if we are yeah. right, we should put, if the patient is affordable, put two plastic stent and a nasocystic drain as well so that it drains out. If patient is affordable, put a metal stent, but also we should put a plastic stent inside because many times this metal stent gets clogged and then they can get infected. No, no, yeah, what I want to say is that if you are putting only plastic stent, always put a nasocystic. nasocystic yes, yes. Otherwise, it will be dangerous. Okay, Prakash, you are trying to say something. Sir, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. 
sir i just want to know what is the technical difficulty just we encounter when there is a left sided portal hypertension associated with severe portal hypertensive gastropathy is there any special precaution we have to take because there will be collaterals beneath that's right so when there is a, um, a portal hypertension which has been documented prior to the procedure then you should be very careful while doing uh, a procedure because there can be varices there can be vessels in the wall so all you should do the procedure only under eus guidance even if there is uh, a good uh, good uh, uh, impression by the cyst don't do a, a blind puncture of the cyst that is the most important thing so you should do an eus guided puncture only and uh, try to avoid these vessels uh, why uh, and uh, choose mm -hmm. a, a good position where you can where there is uh, which is free of these vessels sir from one comment sir uh, since many post graduates and dm residents are there uh, the important thing when you do any us uh, the close approximately the, thick, the approximately should be less than 10 mm that mm. is less than 1 cm and uh, other thing what you have to see is uh, the thickness of the cyst means the capsule what is the whether it is matured or not mm. then the third component is the content mm. of the cyst mm. so mm. before doing any procedure there should be a good approximation especially you are doing a cystic gastrostomy mm. there should be a good approximation to the wall of the no i think uh, any good suggestion i think if uh, because we have already crossed 4 minutes uh, it is 234 i thank both the speakers dr prakash and dr sandeep for uh, enlightening us how we do and when we should do the endoscopic pseudo cyst drainage or wom and once again i thank dr sahu and dr avinash who are uh, in the covid times it's very difficult with all these technical things to do this and i thank both of them for doing a wonderful job thank you very much